Hey yo, LAZ. If you not watching the Sumner series, you not watching the best new series on YouTube. You missing some of the best hood stories on YouTube. Some of the best Rikers Island stories on YouTube. Some of the best jail stories that you going to hear. You going to miss all that. If you lacking like that and you ain't watching this new series. Shout out to the Brooklyn legend Black Knowledge. One of the most legendary Brooklyn Figures that ever walked Brooklyn saw you. Shout out to the whole Sumner Projects, the whole Bed Star, the whole Tompkins, the whole Roosevelt, the whole Bushwick, the whole Marcy. Whoever I'm forgetting, leave it in the comments. Let me know what part of Brooklyn you rep. If you from that Bed Star, I need you to rep extra hard in them comments and let me know what block or what projects in bed style you from and what you repping you heard z-man suicide polo with the ski man running around the hood like he man it's, we see a, a spanish dude come running up the lane from behind him he was literally chasing the bike what then you know last he was be wild that could keep up with a dirt bike like boy come on but he was you know several paces behind but he was still coming but disrespectfully letting that hammer go and the hammer the post was striking poles and fences we hearing the shit where's the bomb because he's riding past up so we now we all ducking and Who was the hierarchy in some of the projects before you really had it? Right, so <clears throat> um, back then, there's so many dudes to name, homie, but actually it would have been the dudes that was before me, the generations or whatever, a generation or two, whatever, that was before me, the dudes like, um, you know, rest in peace, homie, Big Strap. Uh, Strap was from my building. A man, um, Zaquan, Zaquan was from my building. He had an older brother named Pep. His name was Lenny, Lenny and Pep. Um, Shaheed, Shaheed was like from some kind of like Marcy, whatever, but he was from the back of my building. Um, he, you know, rest in peace, Shaheed too, as well. But them dudes that had it before me would have been the, um, definitely before us, the generation that we like closely mimic would have been the, um, the, the Nils is that's the other knowledge and the, and his brothers, uh, I God and, and, and the younger brother Hicks, call him Hickey Do, man natural, and um, you no know, cat, you know Shannon before, you know his situations or whatever went left, and um, couple couple more notable dudes. So with them dudes, right? So to give you a little backdrop of the history, so. Coming up then, watching all of the, some of the older dudes that I mentioned, we was the younger dudes, us, myself in particular, learning the game from them. I was, you know, I was watching them dudes. I would watch them, watch how they moved, watch how they interacted around the projects, see how they dealt with people that wasn't from the projects. And then, you know, whatever information that they spit to me, whatever game they personally gave to me when I was around them, you know, I learned from all of that. But the one of the wildest dudes that I remember that was older, like one of the toughest dudes that, that, that I can recall from my own eyesight, seeing him lay, lay his gangster down was this dude named Shaheed. One of the dudes that I mentioned that was, um that, that passed away, she, Shaheed was a Muslim dude. So I remember, now last, we gonna really get back into some deep history. Now, I told you I moved to Sumner when I was like four or five. So I couldn't have been much more older than that. I had to have been, maybe eight or nine, maybe probably 10 the oldest, if that. So the way the projects is, is um, situated, you know, in front of each building, they have usually have like a little, well, on my side anyway, the Park Ave side, shout out to Park Ave, some the, I know what it is, but um, on my side, we had buildings, like my building, the building in front of my building, that had a little grass area before they started changing it up. And in that little grass area, <clears throat> dudes used to play football so this is where we started building up some of our toughness we, we used to play the, the older dudes how to play tackle football none of that two-hand touch shit with no, with no equipment get that football ball you better keep it moving because <laughs> when they catch you they piling on you 
So we playing football one day, and I'll never forget this. There was an older dude from our building named uh, Robert. I think his name was Robert Nolan. I think he had a brother named Boo Boo Nolan. Boo Boo Nolan was this big athletic dude that was nice in a lot of sports. So it was them, I think the cat Shaheed, a couple other cats from the builders, you know, connecting builders. We was playing each other. And um, so we playing a football game. We running, we tackling, whatever, whatever. So if some dudes on Park Avenue, coming up past some of the projects like two or three dudes they was I don't know I didn't think they was doing anything wrong they was just walking through you know walking up the projects not even necessarily through the projects because they was on Park Avenue they was coming up the block so let me just quickly briefly give you the synopsis of the way we see Sumner so Sumner consists of of uh, Park Avenue right from let's say if you start down from Troop Avenue going up to like Lewis and then from Lewis Avenue going up to Myrtle, then from Myrtle Avenue coming all the way back down to Troop. That's what we consider some of the projects. Got across the street, 303, they're part of Summer too, but growing up, they weren't necessarily considered some of the project dudes because, you know, they didn't, they was kind of did their own thing. They never, they was a part of Summer, but they never really interacted with the project dudes like that. But anyway, getting back to the story with the dude Shahi and, and the three dudes. So we playing football. I'm like, couldn't have been seven, eight, nine, something like that. They playing. So I, all I remember is him, dude Shahi said, hey, yo, hold up, hold up, hold up, one second. So everybody stopped to see what the hold up was about. He said, hold up, hold up, one second in the middle of the game. So he start walking towards towards Park Avenue, towards where, you know, right in the grass area, towards where the three dudes was walking up at. And he stopped him, like, yo, 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 hold up, hold up. Y'all dudes, hold up. So I'm like, I'm following behind, you know, little kid nosy and shit. I'm following behind to see to see what the fuck was going on. I'm like, what's what happened? So everybody else confused too. So he like, yo, yo, this is no cap. Um, as anything I tell you is not going to be no cap I'm telling you vividly and directly from my own memory and from my own experiences no fabrications or embellishments or nothing when Shahi stopped them three dudes he said hey yo what the fuck are y'all doing walking through my projects like y'all niggas is tough Diddy bopping with ice grills and all that y'all looking over here at us like, like y'all want some like y'all want to do something Yo, this is the one, I'm t- I never, first of all, I've never seen nothing like this before, number one. He was by himself, even though all of us was here, he told us, hold up, and walked off by himself. He didn't look back to see if anybody was following him or nothing. This was him, of his own accord, pressing three dudes that was walking through the projects, and again, last, from my observation, I don't know if he had beef with them, whatever, whatever, but from my observation, they wasn't doing nothing, simply or it's nothing other than simply walking up the aisle along the side of the project. But the dude Shahid, he, I guess he didn't like the look on their faces as they was walking through the projects for, like, I don't even remember if they had a, you know, at home, you know, most black people have a ditty bop or swag that they wore. Some dudes emphasize a little more with the tough guy shit, but I, I don't recall none of that. My young man, I don't recall none of that. I just recall him walking through the peas and he pressed them like, you know, fuck y'all don't walk through here. Y'all don't walk through here like y'all talk. You stand up straight, walk regular, and don't make no eye contact with nobody in there. And that's why I was like, what the fuck? What kind of shit was that? So when he did all of that, said all that, and then he came back to us, the older dudes was like, yo, Shari, what you doing? He's like, fuck all that. Don't nobody be coming through Sumner, walking like they tough and all that this our hood. So, so, bro, right then, from that experience, right then and there, that was my first encounter with, okay, I guess this is how you spoil the rep for your hood. When you rep in your hood, when you rep in your little projects or whatever, don't nobody supposed to come through here even with the appearance of disrespect. Even if they're not saying nothing, nothing, you're not supposed to be coming through here walking like you crazy hard or walking like you crazy tough. If you did, niggas just press me. So, okay, so boom, that was that. That was my introduction that's what I got from that. So now, you know, so moving forward, um, from there, I'm like, okay, and then I told you about some of the stories where, where you know, dudes was getting the hammers and all that and putting in the work. But so from the Shahi dude that I was mentioning, and then to the to the to the Hickey dudes and the Argos and the Nilsers. And 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 the, and the lights, those dudes was putting off for the projects. Like dudes 
my man Gordy and them from 808, Duke, Juan, all them dudes and dudes up the hill from us, Alby Al, Henny Hen, Quali and all them. I would see these dudes that was a couple generations older than me constantly in situations. Man, Wayno from 824, David Parker, these dudes run around robbing people and they was running around shooting up the projects. Again, that wasn't a good thing. Necessarily, it wasn't a good or bad thing back then. It just was what it was. I didn't look at it like a good or bad thing. I just looked at it like, okay, information. This is what dudes is doing. You know, I, I, yeah, it's fun. I don't know. This is. I'm assuming this is how we're supposed to put on. So again, I'm watching these dudes. So them dudes that have the projects, they they put on, but and, and we, the, my peer group. The, of individuals that I was fucking with as we growing up watching these dudes we watch them and we learn it from their mistakes and their errors and shit like that so we figuring out for ourselves alright when it's our turn this is how we gonna do it so all them dudes that I mentioned or whatever that put on for something and all that they definitely put on even the dudes from the other half the Tommy Two Tufts VLs and all them dudes that was over there the uh, Powerfuls and all them dudes the Goosey Loves that was putting on all them dudes put on it was put off as something lovely. It's no, no dispute in that. But from my perspective, right? And you know, this is this will be subject to debate. But from my perspective, nobody put on in something the way we put on. When I say we, I mean my generation of dudes. Because again, we learned from the dudes before us, and then it was you know a couple of dudes with some hands on their shoes, and it was like, all right, we get our opportunity shot. This is what we doing, and so when we got our opportunity to shine, we did everything we saw them doing plus some. So we upped it. Everything we saw them doing, and some of the things that we saw that they could have did differently and did better, we made sure that we did it differently and did it better. So that's how our name, my generation of dudes, cast name started resonating, and all the older dudes that's still around that didn't pass away. When they went up north and heard about us and they came home, they, they always give our team of dudes the, the respect because they said, yo, they did their thing, but they was like, yo, boy, nobody put on like y'all dudes did. Y'all really repped for the hood and, 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 and y'all really put on. So, you know, I always take that like, all right, I mean, good, bad, and different, ugly, whatever, man. Like I said, it was what it was. And then, you know, with it being that, everything that we did was always about putting on. So those dudes that I mentioned was the dudes that had the projects before me and before my team of individuals that was doing their little thing, putting their little work, robberies, man downs, whatever they was doing. And then, you know, we came into play. And when we came into play, it was just a little bit different, homie. When did it come to a point where, where people or you could actually say, Yo, I run Sumner, or my people's run Sumner, or my team run Sumner. Yeah, you put smiles on my face last, because I got to give you, you know, your, your flowers on your journalistic skills with the questions and shit, because a lot of stuff I forget, but then the way you word the questions will bring me right there. All right, so for me, so look, this is how I look at it, homie. For everybody that put on respectively in their hearts, right, the way I viewed it was, you have to have the support in the backing of your hood when you're putting on for said hood, right? Because a lot of times, you know, you have, you know, older people when you're doing wild shit, they're quick to call the cops on you or quick to sick the man on you or whatever, whatever, or quick to run to your parents and always say, you know, a lot of negative shit about you. So a lot of times the way we did shit, we always wanted to get the respect from the elders so that's why we gave them respect not just the elders in terms of the dudes but the, the women bro the older black women in our products we knew we was running around violating and putting people's lives in jeopardy and shit like that so we tried to to to, to counter that by doing positive shit so now how my how I got to know that yeah something was mine was I'll never forget an incident we was it had to have been like around the I don't know, around the 4th of July, something like that. Whatever it was, it, it, if it wasn't the 4th of July, it was something close to one of those holidays. It was hot outside. This had to have been like 85, 86, 1985, 86. What could have been before that? Whoever fact checkers, get in the comments. Let me know what year I'm talking about. But, 
but for the people of Sumner that remember this incident, this is how Sumner came into my possession. We was in, we was, we was down by 808, building called 808. Uh, that's adjacent to or behind uh, the public school PS 59, sitting on the benches. It's myself, it's my comrades, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, Hash, a couple other dudes, Weibo, Tim, Hunt, we all on the bench, bunch of us, some of the dudes, bunch of some of the dudes. And we, and back then, we used to steal uh, bikes, dirt bikes, them KLRs and them XL 350s and all that. My man that I told you about before, Charlie Knowledge B, he was a bike fanatic enthusiast and a bike thief. So he taught us how to steal bikes. So we would always go to different hoods, take the bikes, and then we would be bring the bikes back to our private street like this hours, wash it and all that wild <laughs> shit. Street. Listen, we treated everything stolen, homie, like it was ours. Cars that we stole, we had in the you know, we had about 15, 20 stolies in the parking lot at some point, and my whole watch was just anything like, like they was ours. I don't know we was out of control. But back to the story, we had some stolen bikes. So, uh, God bless the dad, the homie Raleigh. Raleigh was um, Knowledge B, older brother. Raleigh was one of my big older heads and one of my men that I that I loved as a kid who brought up because Raleigh was this real, this kind of short dude, like maybe like Kevin Hart, a little bit taller than Kevin Hart height, but his heart was. His heart was phenomenal. He was a, a gangster from you know his era of old dudes, the way he would put on. So he didn't necessarily know how to ride bikes, but he used to like him to ride bikes. So either he had came home from either DFR or one of them up north ends, and we was all in a project with stolen bikes. So Raleigh got on the bike. I let Raleigh take my bike. And uh, H, my, my, uh, one of my homies, H, my crimey H, he was on another bike. So H and I think Weibo went riding off somewhere. Uh, Raleigh went riding off somewhere. So on the bench, on the bench by the eight builders, a bunch of us, like maybe 10, 15 of them. So like half an hour go by, we sitting there, we just chopping up, talking war stories. Mind you, I told you, I believe it was the 4th of July or something like that because to my right, to, directly to my right of uh, the lane of benches that we were sitting on by 8 way is the park, like 59 Park. A park with swings and rods for kids, sliding boards and all that stuff. I think that the kids from public school, when they would recess, they would recess into that little public project park and play. So, but it wasn't school time. This was in the summertime. So it's everybody out there. I, it's people out there grilling. I remember people out there grilling. It was people out there grilling, cooking. I think the dude that from my building I was talking about, Robert Nolan, or uh, Google them, they was there. I know Robert was there, grilling. Dude, Donnie from 824, another older dude, Foots, my man Foots from 808, and all of the older dudes, they was there grilling. So we all sitting down, music playing, we chilling. We hear the like, and then we hear mad shots. So I'm like, oh shit. So, you know, everybody jumped up. So now we in the projects, we ain't even got our hammers on us like that. We was playing, but we wasn't playing to, we was playing, but not all the way, all the way, all the way like that. We were still building that, but we were still playing. But I didn't have my hammer on me, but my building was the closest. Hash didn't have his hammer on him. Hash building was behind us across the street or some of the half side. So we hit the gunshots fire. Bah, 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 bah. My man, H, he riding up, up, up from Park Ave, up the lane on the bike, flying. And I guess my man, uh, Weebo, was on the back. Weebo jumps off the back of the bike, runs into the building, and, and, and H, he's, he, he maneuvers the bike around to where we at, to cut back through the park to get away from, you know what I mean, the gunshots. We didn't know, but the gunshots was at him. So now it's, we see a, a Spanish dude come running up the lane from behind him. He was literally chasing the bike. What thing you know, lads? These dudes be wild. That could keep up with a dirt bike. Like, boy, come on. But he was, you know, several paces behind, but he was still coming. But disrespectfully letting that hammer go. And the hammer, the bullets was striking poles and fences. We hearing the shit. Where's the bomb? Because he riding half up. So we now we all ducking in the run mode. You know what I mean? Just to ascertain what's going on before we, you know what I mean, go take off and get the things. We got to see where the threat coming from. So boom, he came running past the acre. It's Puerto Rican cat from Tongas named uh, 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 Jeff, white boy. He, he looked white, but I think he spoke Spanish, but he was he was a well-known gun buster and a hitter on, on the Latino tip from, from Tongas from Tongas projects. Uh, uh, white boy Jeff is what we called him. So 
he came running through, busting the hammer. So now, mind you, we all running, right? So he, you know, he had us. Because he came running straight in that direction. Because my man H rode the bike past him. So he back, he got the hammer, waving the hammer back and forth. And everybody like, and, but he knew my man Hash. They went to school together. He used to call my man Hash uh, uh, Harry. So he like, so we, you know what I mean? We looking like, yo, boy, what you doing? And he waved the gun, yo, Harry, yo, my, let motherfuckers know they riding bikes and crashing the people. Disrespect while I play that. I'm a murderer. Those always was giving speeches back then. I don't understand all that. Like, like, so I'm, we all stand there listening, but we got our hands like, all right, boy, you right, you got it. Right, you a the right. Niggas about, all right, do your thing, got it. So, and then he said what he said, he walked off through the park. As soon as he walked off last through that park, it looked like a, a rat race maze to the hammers. It was, we was off. We had a little hole in the fence, has cut through the fence because he could cut through another part of the fence to take him to his building quicker. But like I said, my building was first. So when I turned that bend, I'm top speeding it to my crib to get the joint. The joint that I had at that time was the 4th fifth, and I traded that because I didn't like that because it kept jamming. I had the blue steel 4th fifth, like nine shots, had that in a stash in the crib. So now, mind you, like I said, you had to get to support from the people in your projects for you to do certain shit. This was broad daylight now because I told you it was cookouts, people cooking out, eating, whatever, whatever. I'm running through the projects. The people in my projects that know me, like the older ladies or whatever, whatever, that heard the gunshots that was ducking, it was a summer day. Everybody was outside. They see me running to my building. They already know what it's hitting for because they've seen that scene several occasions. Me running to the building, or my brother running to the building. We going to get them things coming back out and it get crazy. So I ran to the building. I ran in the crib. I got the fourth fifth. Now I'm running back to with it with it with this incident transpired with son came busting through with the hammer disrespectfully violating so now i'm running back in that direction i'll never forget it was this lady from 824 the building across from us her name was dina she lived on the first floor her and my moms had lady beef from back in the days, so they never really liked each other so they just kept their distancing and i didn't like them because my moms didn't like them and they probably didn't like me because my moms didn't like them or whatever but this same lady Dina, when she seen me running the crib and run back out the crib, she, grown ass woman now, so old grown ass woman, she said, Joe, make sure you go get whoever that was. So, okay, now I'm really hyped. I'm like, oh, the support, right? From somebody that I didn't even thought liked me. So I'm like, all right, boom. Now I'm running back to the instant to where we came from. And as I'm running back over there, at the same time, my man Raleigh that had my bike. It wasn't my bike, I stole it, but it was still my shit. He had my bike, he came back, he had a flat, and he was pushing it. And he seen me running back through 59, through the park, and he stopped. He said, yo, go through the backside. He said, nah, let's go through the backside. He's still right there. He's right there in in front of uh, Tonkin's projects and some of the projects on Troop Avenue. He said, he right there, get him. So I, I crept through the back, and, and I and popped out of the So now the whole scene that made me remember everything so vividly is that as I was creeping on the side of the building to pop out on them from behind, you know, 59, it's the way you can come through. And when you pop out, instead of being in a big part of the park, you were in a little lane. That little lane right where I popped out at, when I popped, before I popped out, I saw to my left slowly in slow motion because everything happened for me in slow motion every time I was about to really really get crazy so in slow motion I see the dude Robert Nolan Donnie Foots and a couple of older, other older black women arguing with the dude in the he was sitting in a car it was another Spanish dude driving he was in the passenger seat and he had his head out the, you know the windows rolled down and he was arguing and he was arguing with them like whatever from my recollection, I think and I believe that the people from my project was like, yo, why would you come through here shooting? It's all of these kids out here. You could have hit a kid, whatever, whatever they were saying. And he was, you know, on his talk about shit, voicing his opinion, saying back what he was saying. So when I came from behind the, behind the wall and popped out from the side of 59, the dude, Robert, saw me out the corner of his eye because I it was like a blur when I just came out right into the middle of the street where he was on the sidewalk talking to the dude when I came out to the middle of the street 
my, you know, that thing was, you know, coming upward. And brother, see me, he, even if he, I don't even know, because it was slow motion, even if he was telling me, yo, no, chill, there was no, no, chill once the thing started going up. So when that, you know, when I raised that thing, I, I was already firing from when I popped out and before I even got to the street. And when I was taught to put the pain in, we was always taught, you know, to hawk shit down. Like, you know what I mean? Don't shoot from a distance and behind, behind shit. No, hawk shit down, meaning run at your prey like a lion chasing a deer or something until you catch it. You don't, you know, so I'm running at him shooting. Top speed with my little young speed with the fourth fifth. That whole shit was ringing, lads, ringing. Now, the window started shouting. I wasn't, again, I wasn't the best aim. So he was talking this shit and I was already running and aggravating and shooting with the adrenaline. So when I started shooting at him and the bust the windows out, he immediately ducked. He immediately ducked in the car and I didn't think to shoot through the doors. Now I'm all, it's all head action for us. So we head hunting. So I'm shooting for heads and the dude that was driving ducked down and, and, and shot the car down the ab down Troop Ave and I'm running down the middle of the street behind Troop Ave chasing the car letting that thing go I let about four or five more go on that joint and then came back walking the same way that I came from and back into the project now when I this was the thing for me that's when I knew I had it when I walked back into that project last and this is no cap everybody that can remember the story is going to test to it when I walked back into that project last it was about hundred people, kids, grown people, older dudes, and my peers standing there clapping. I'm like, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? And so that was my first taste of okay. If you, I guess, if you're doing something for the for the for the hood and you're doing it right, you're gonna get the accolades and the praise. So from that incident right there, I guess everybody in the hood of Sumner, in the projects of Sumner that was out that day respected me as one of the individuals that they knew that was going to put on for the hood. Like, that, whoever that was, he wasn't from my projects. He came through shooting disrespectful kids and it's still disrespectful when people trying to check him and all that and that nobody had a gun though, which was weird to me. Like, y'all dudes doing all that talking, fuck all that talking. He didn't come through talking. My thing was, and, and I think it's something that last was, we do the same shit that other people do and we try to do it better than they do. So if you come through my shit with your gun roaring, what the, what am I talking to you about, homie? You already made your statement. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your statement spoke loud and clear. So, okay. If, if we don't get put down and we got an opportunity to, go, to, to get even, we we going to get them things and we coming back to answer your statement. Our thing was all, all call outs were mandatory. So that was a call out. If you come through somebody hood busting, you calling everybody in there out because you randomly busting at everybody. So we accepted the call out. I stood there. Hoss, my man Hoss, like I said, by the time he got ran to get his gun and he lived on the seventh floor running up the stairs and then man by the time he did all that the smoke was already clear I was already coming back through the projects receiving the accolades the cheers the pat on the shoulders and, and then the dude around the dolan that was from my building they didn't even know I was you know we kept shit quiet certain, to a certain extent he didn't know that I you know that I was playing with the pistols like that so I guess in his eyes was like oh damn the little homie from the building on the first floor he, he put it on. So from that incident on, I was, you know, recognized that, okay, something that's me. Because I was going to be one of the, throughout the history of it, I was always going to be one of the main characters or one of the main individuals whenever there was a problem, putting my life on the line and, 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 and you know what I mean, banging bang out for the horn. You know, so yeah, that was a, and the wild shit was my man. That was getting chased. <laughs> that was getting chased on the bike and shit getting shot at. He he shot back, shot across the street in time because he said he threw the bike and ran up the stairs and, and, and went all the way to the roof and was and, and was on the roof chilling. I don't know what that was back then, lad. That was our shit. When we was on the takeoff, we would go up to the roof and or go across the roof or whatever and, and look down and see what the fuck was going on. But he said he went up to the roof and he heard the shots and he didn't know what was going on. But when he came down, you know, we, we told him whatever, and um, 
like I said, I got my props for that. And boy, you know, boy came back to do uh, uh, White Boy Jeff because, like I said, he was a solid dude. He came back trying to um, trying to answer our answer to what he did. So you know, it was, it was a little back and forth shit, a couple times and shit. And I was, but, but but the funny shit was like, you know, some older dudes intervened, actually strapped. My man, dude, so here the wild shit is, Strap, God bless you there, Strap is the brother, the older brother of the dude Ace that I'm telling you about that was on the bike. So Strap, when Strap heard about dudes trying to kill his brother, and then he heard about me putting on, so he one day we in front of my building and shit, and the, and the dude, same dude, Jeff, come back. He didn't, I don't think he necessarily knew it was me that was shooting at him, or if he did, you know what I mean? He he kept it vague or whatever, but he knew it was a, a little Dawson dude, a little black dude or whatever, whatever. So I probably fit the description of dudes. Like I said, they was looking for dudes or whatever. Supposedly me, from what everybody was telling me, like, oh, you shot them, whatever, you almost killed me, whatever. And and I didn't hit none of them. The crazy, that was the crazy shit. And that was where one of some of my old heads was like, yeah, homie, you going to the shooting range, because you, that was point blank range. You chasing the car and all that. There should have been blood everywhere. Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen on me. I'm a firm believer of that. So that shit didn't play out on a on a man down situation because it wasn't in the cards for it to go that way yet. I still had reputation to build and I still had work to put in. I still had shit to learn. But you know, because if it would have went the man down situation and both of them would have been down, then I would have probably never got to be acknowledged of all of the accumulated situations probably just from that little one isolated incident but dudes wouldn't have got to see my my body of work that's a fact you know what I mean? and what's and what's even crazier about that is how old was you when you said that happened that ha- when that happened I was like 15 alright so let's say you would have man down both of them or somebody at 15 like real talk you might have went to the can for about the next 15 years cause you was under 16 at the time but it's like do you, it's a hundred niggas in the penitentiary right now that they was repping for they hood like that and they got they caught they came out the house caught a body immediately for the hood and niggas went up in the mountains for 15 20 years and the whole hood done forgot about them niggas and when they come home they come home like yeah i repped i put on for the hood they come home niggas don't even know who them niggas are yeah and, and, and what's even crazier is like, bro, you was dropping jewels because what a lot of people may not understand about the ghetto, if they never lived in the ghetto or the hood or whatever, is a lot of dudes who became killers, a lot of dudes who was busting a gun, they started off defending their hood from reckless, from reckless bullies from another hood. You feel me? And the love that dudes received from defending their hood it's like the community was scared the community was scared of the of of dudes that come through and rob and shoot and kill and do what they do and the, at the time the community couldn't depend on the police to to protect the hood from the type of shit that was going on at two in the morning and broad daylights and all of that. So the community began to rely on the thugs, the thugs from the hood to, to basically police the hood and keep them safe. <laughs> so, Talk this shit, man. Talk you feel this me? Shit, homie. So a lot of gangsters and shooters, their their origins came from protecting their own community from psychotic killers. That's a fact. You feel me? And and niggas got sucked into the game. And when they got sucked into the game, they started realizing that they was in the streets. Now they need to eat. So they got sucked into getting money in the streets, and it didn't really. It wasn't really planned that way. And it's crazy because if we was living in medieval times, what these gangsters and shooters would be is knights in shining armor. Talk heavy, homie. Knights in shining armor that protected their community and their town or their village from invaders. Because it's not a lot of people that's going to put their life on the line and their freedom on the line for their community. And that's what a lot of dudes did. Not every dude. Some dudes in our hoods, they took advantage of their own hood. That's a fact. 
Some niggas was bad apples. You understand? But there was other dudes that they just wasn't trying to hear that reckless shit in they hood. You understand? So it was crazy. And even that nigga who came shooting at the at your bro on the bike. He probably felt niggas was vi- dangerously violating his hood, like he said. Actually, you are one hundred percent correct in your analysis of that homie. What his argument was was that my homie was robbing the bike through the projects recklessly and bumped into him, banged him with the bike, and, and kept it moving without saying a pardon me or nothing. So, like I said, he was a dude, probably been in and out of jail. He had a little reputation in the hood amongst the blacks and the Hispanics of a uh, being a gun buster and a tough guy. So. Yeah, you know, so imagine that, right? You think you run in the hood or, or you repping and your name resonates. Somebody come racing through disrespectfully on a bike, probably ice grilling you, banging to you, don't show you no respect, don't say part me. A lot of dudes die for disrespectful acts or what people perceive the disrespectful acts. If they would have been like, wait, that was, and that was one another that was one of the conversations that I had with my homie Ace afterwards. And I said, damn, homie, you know, boy was a, was a wild dude. If you banged into him, you could have at least said, pardon me, in this whole situation, what it came about. His response was he didn't even recall bumping into that dude. He could have. He said, because, you know, riding wild and fast. And again, last, we were reckless. And in and, and the point where we were, because we were cocky and confident. It was a regular bike? No, a bike, stolen bike. Uh, uh, one of them XL. It was an XL Brown 125. He had the brown XL125. Even riding a motorbike through a nigga hood will cause problems. It's just it's too gangster. A motor a dirt bike is too gangster. When you ride a dirt bike through a nigga hood, a nigga gonna feel a certain kind of way. Especially if you're not from his hood and he'll fuck with you like that. That's that's a whole fact, homie. That's a whole fact. And and, and we got stories. So that's how some of the beefs got between my team of dudes and some of the, and the older dudes from Muncy that you know what I mean that we that we cool fuck with now like shout out to my homie Hal Val and Stan and all those from the Notion side on that and a, a, a Muncy that was putting on and they didn't like the fact that you know they was in jail and when they came home from jail like I said we had hooked up with the Loves and the T-Lows and the Tatas and all that from Muncy and we was a group of young dudes Recklessly doing our thing, riding bikes, and, and Marcy's big. Marcy's like the, you know, Marcy, you could drive through Marcy because Marcy's set up that way to, you know, for cars to drive through the actual projects. So we used to, and to remember, everything we had was stolen, but we treated it like it was ours. So we would take our stolen bikes, the stolen cars, and be racing through Marcy, chasing each other, trying to knock each other off the bike with the stolen cars. Kicking the cars on bikes and racing, just violating. And I know them dudes was like, oh, you know what I mean? Rightfully so. What's up with these dudes coming through? They're not even from Marcy. So I get it. I get it. I didn't get it back then. It was it was on and it was popping because I didn't get it. I understand that. And then, you know, that came. And I didn't look at it as like I was I was really necessarily putting on and protecting from my home because I didn't have the concept and the understanding of all that at 15, 16. All I was responding to was the disrespect you coming through shooting and then you shooting at my man sir we gotta get to that so you know that's that's how that came about but what you said was correct about how dudes were revered for standing up and representing their heart and some of them right so in some of them when I go through the history because it's all you know spread it out but it'll come together you know when we first started coming up Together, it was a group of dudes like it was myself, my brother. My brother' name is Poison. Everybody know Black Knowledge. They know Black Knowledge and Poison. They know yeah, I see somebody poison. left a comment and said, "Is this the same Black Knowledge who got a brother named Poison?" Oh, what? Yeah, somebody said that in the comments. Oh, so you know I don't read the comments per your per your advice. I don't really read the comments and shit. But okay, so yeah, whoever that was, probably they know. Yeah, but that's a fact. My little bro, name is Poison and shit. So prior to us. You know, individual, I mean, becoming the group, we was in like little pockets of packets of, uh, uh, of, of dudes that, you know, got busy and then we all came together as one whole, some of the projects, but from my building, it was myself, my brother, uh, Poise, upstairs was my man H, the same dude, H, and I was telling you about that, I was on a bike, 
My man Shah and his brother Bob, a couple other dudes, notable cats. I get to them, some of them later, the older dudes, the Spanish dudes and all that. A lot of notable cats. But we used to run around calling ourselves uh, Poison Clan. Like, because my brother's name is Poison and shit. And, you know, his little clan was called Poison Clan and shit. Him, H, uh, Hunt, Hunt, Brother Hash, and all them, you know, they was like the little Poison Clan. That's what we used to call them, the Poison Clan. Then I had my group of dudes, me, myself, Knowledge B, whoever, my man Joe from Bushwick and all that. Um, yeah, we got we got to get back to the Bushwick dudes too because they definitely put on there's some cats in there that definitely definitely put on and I don't want to make it seem like I we didn't fuck with Bushwick. I had some homies from, in Bushwick too that definitely was putting on. So it was definitely some Bushwick cats that was putting on. We'll get back to that. Part and self, rest in peace, my bro, Majesty Mel from Bushwick Projects that recently passed away. It's my bro. I love you, my bro. Not me, but yeah, my fault. Respect, respect, definitely respect. Always give respect where respect is due. So I said it was the little poison clan then, whatever. And then we, we graduated and changed our name. We became, we became the brothers. And what I said was, tipping my hat to all of the Brooklyn gangsters and the cats that came up respectively in their hoods, putting on. But, you know, I want to correct a little bit of, you know, Brooklyn history. At some point I heard, or somebody brought, brought it to my attention that some you know, individuals outside of some that was like kind of like referring to themselves as the brothers. So let me correct history. The brothers came from some of the projects, right? So they were the the original, you know, brothers, the group of brothers was from some of the projects. And the reason they called us the brothers, we actually got the, the name the brothers from a chick, uh, not a chick, from a, a, a woman that I referred to, you know, like my sister, her name Tiffany. Tiffany, Tiffany from the projects, um, and and it was this girl named Novell from Marcy. I always thought she was from Tonkin, but I recently found out she was actually from Marcy. But Tiffany and her little girl crew, and, and from Tonkins and Novell and all that from Marcy, had a deep little clique of girls or whatever. And they would always hang out in my projects in Sumner, and they would always um, see us walking through on our various missions to do whatever we wanted. Were about to do, and they would always, Tiffany would always be saying, like, yeah, they go my brothers right there, like, you know, they're about to do something, they look like they have to something. When them brothers start, you know, you see them brothers walking around with that certain look, I better get ready to run because it's about to go down. So, uh, Tiffany consistently and constantly referred to us as her brothers, the brothers, that name stuck with us because Novell and them they was from Marcy they didn't really know us they was getting to know us so I guess when they went back down telling these stories all oh, these dudes from somewhere oh what's their name I don't know they just called them the brothers so that's where we got the name from the brothers so if anybody else was 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 claiming the brothers and they was affiliated with us or whatever that's cool but if you weren't affiliated with us and you were saying y'all was the brothers that's not actual Brooklyn history the brothers came from some of the projects and I'm gonna tell you some of the reasons why we just called the brothers. So now, as you mentioned, how dudes respectfully put off of their hood the, and, you know, don't allow dudes to come through the hood, violate, disrespect, whatever, whatever. There were several incidences where dudes would come from different hoods, right, into into some to see the girls because that's what dudes do you know sometimes dudes don't mess with the girls from their own hoods or when they do they get older they graduate from the girls in their own hoods and they start exploring other hoods because we always I, me personally I always thought that Bushwick Projects Marcy Projects I always thought they had the girls like you know what I mean so we was always at that age wherever the girls were but anyway dudes probably felt the same way about some of them dudes from other hoods probably felt the same way about some of the girls that were in some of the, the prettier girls and they was coming through second so it was a couple instances I guess where dudes I guess probably stepped out of line or whatever and they like, so now I tell you at this point I got the hood my team of dudes we got the hood so we getting little, little snippets of different stories from dudes like yo yeah, dudes came through to see such and such and they was violating it or this dude had a hammer and all sorts of wild shit so now whenever we hear a shit we going to seek out these stories because I told you we had the hood so we was regulating the repping for the hood so we wanted to hear the stories from the individuals that were possibly you know victims of whatever so we hearing all these stories so I'm like alright so okay so niggas coming through here they doing too much and they coming to see these girls and they violating so I had to have a long conversation you know what I mean with the girls from my hood Tiffany's and our little crew like listen and then I told them I said yo so what we doing 
what the bro, what my homies is doing, we implementing curfew. So this is all facts. Uh, that Sumner had a curfew, and the curfew started at eight o'clock sharp. And I'm gonna tell you one incident where we gave a dude until eight thirty. You know, we just on the strip of being connected, whatever, with my peoples or whatever. We gave, you know, we kind of like gave them a pass. He'll remember. But anyway, eight o'clock was the curfew. So you know, we we started getting backlash from the girls. They like, no, you know, y'all y'all talking this eight o'clock curfew and shit and all that. What does that mean? That means, and this is what I would explain to them. That means that if we catch a nigga in Sumner. It's not from something that happened at 8 o'clock and we didn't give him the okay to be here, he might not make it out of here. That's what that means. So now, when you implement policy and you stand on that type of policy and do see you executing off of that, it, 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 it spreads out. So words started spreading out around Brooklyn like, yo, boy, some of the boys catch you down as some dudes call themselves the brothers or whatever. The niggas catch you down to Sunday and them projects after 8 o'clock, boy, he might be fish food. So we were starting going around like, don't be. And listen, we implemented a curfew and, and to enforce that curfew, we, we implemented what was known as what we called project patrol.